You're welcome to the fifth presentation in the third webinar series presented by the International Adoption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to the advancing adoption challenges through the promotion of adoption research and education. We hope that all of our attendees, their families, and their colleagues are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series has been an immense success and the recordings of our webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube. This is the fifth webinar of the third series, which we intend to continue with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Announcements regarding the third series will be distributed through the IS mailing list and IS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by Professor Suresh Bhatia from the University of Queensland in Australia. I'm Guo Ping Hu from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Today's webinar will be moderated by Gong Kui Xiao from the University of Western Australia. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, and other moderators are not necessarily those of the IS or the institutions associated with those, those individuals. We ask you to consider joining IAS as a regular member if you're not already. Our deals are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year. But to support the publication of our flagship journal, adoption, contribute to travel grants and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as its organization of our trial conference on the fundamentals of adoption. Members also receive free access to IS supported materials, including our journal, as well as adoption database published by Springer Materials. Anyone can follow IS on Twitter for information about scientific meetings. Please help us expanding. I'll now hand it over to Gong Kui Xiao, who will moderate the seminar and the QA session. Gong Kui, please. Yep. Now I will introduce Professor Suresh Bhatia. Professor Bhatia received his PhD in chemical engineering from University of Pennsylvania and joined the University of Queensland in 1996. His main research interests are in the simulation and the adsorption and in the simulation of adsorption and transport in nanoporous materials and in heterogeneous reaction engineering, where he has authored over 300 scientific papers in leading international journals. He has received numerous awards for his research, including the Exmobile Award for Excellence in Chemical Engineering from ICAMI and Vice Chancellor's Award for Research Excellence at UQ. Between 2010 and 2015, he held an Australian pro professorial fellowship from the Australian Research Council. He is a fellow of two major academies, Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, and the Indian Academy of Sciences. He served as the regional editor of the International Journal Molecular Simulation between 2009 and 2015. Today, he will talk about transport in porous materials. And during the webinar, questions can be submitted to the speaker via the Q&A tab of the Zoom or as comments on the YouTube in, uh, live stream. So Suresh, now I'm going to hand over the control to you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And I also thank the International Adsorption Society for inviting me to present this, this seminar as part of their education series. So today I'll talk about trans modeling transport in nanoporous materials. Let me now get my, uh, share my screen. Oh, this is already in PowerPoint mode and it's ready. Okay, good. Uh, so why are nanoporous materials important? Uh, nanoporous materials are those that have pores of the order of size of the order of a nanometer. And this happens to be the length scale of Van der Waals interactions. So in nanoporous materials, which have such, uh, nan which have nanopores of this, uh, of about a nanometer or so, 
you can expect very strong adsorptive forces because that's the length scale, as I mentioned, of, of uh, Van der Waals interactions. So you get very high densities of fluids in those materials. As a result, they are sort of very suitable for adsorptive separations, gas storage, membrane separations, and a variety of other applications. There's been a lot of work done uh, uh, in the literature on adsorption in these materials. Uh, but what controls the kinetics of uh, kinetics of any for any process is the diffusion inside the material, and uh, that has received a lot less attention. Uh, today, I will talk about how we model transport uh, in such materials. In particular, uh, I will talk about uh, our results over the last two decades, but put them in a format which is compatible with the educational format. Uh, of this webinar. So it won't be pitched at a research level, but rather at a level where, uh, where I want to transmit the results to people who can use it. Okay, let's get to the next slide. I think I'll have to change the uh, cursor back. No, why is it, sorry. Uh, when you're using the pointer, you might have to use your keyboard to just move. Yeah. Back. Okay. Okay. So now as I went to, uh, okay, I'll use the keyboard in that case. So in this webinar, we will cover uh, the basics of what is the transport coefficient? Uh, what is, uh, how do we define it? We'll talk about tortuosity. We all know about tortuosity, that it is uh, related to the distance actually moved by molecule as opposed to the distance uh, in the net diffusion direction. Uh, however, what I will do is I will give a precise geometric definition to it and show how it is related to the geometrical parameters uh, or the angle distribution of the, uh, of the pores. Then we will talk about uh, transport modeling at the single pore level at low density. Uh, before you can apply uh, any diffusion model to a medium, we need to get it at various pore sizes and then average it over the uh, pore network. So we first start with single pore level transport modeling, and later we will see how we can integrate it over a network. Then I'll talk about the role of surface texture. Uh, traditional models such as the Knudsen model assume uh, diffuse reflection at the surface. However, the actual uh, level of momentum lost, whether it is diffuse or partially diffuse, depends on the rough surface roughness. And while the diffuse reflection model is good with very large pores, uh, in small pores of the order of a nanometer, where fluid solid interactions play a very strong role, we need to uh, introduce, we need to consider the surface texture of the solid. Another example is the Navier-Stokes equations. When you integrate them for laminar flow in a tube, we have our quadratic velocity profile based on the assumption of no slip. We cannot do that at the nano scale. We have to really consider the actual solid surface structure and get a better boundary condition at the surface. Having done single component modeling, we will look at multi-component modeling. At low density, even a multi-component system can be modeled uh, as various single components because the molecules of different species are not interacting. At higher density, uh, we need special models for multi-component transport, which we will discuss. Then we are ready to integrate everything into a, into a porous material, and we will discuss how we average things over the porous material. Finally, I will talk about the effect of boundaries at finite system size. The models that we traditionally use are based on, uh, say, such as the Knudsen equation or the hagen pozul solution, are not valid very close to the boundary. We use a boundary condition when solving a second order differential equation uh, for the transport uh, in a pore. But in reality, near the boundary where you have an asymmetry, you have solid on one side and gas or liquid on the other, the transport coefficient is not the same as that deep in, in the interior. So we will talk about how the boundaries influence the system, uh, how the boundaries influence the transport for small systems. Okay. So let's look at first some common and of course materials. We have materials that have nearly ideal geometry. For example, carbon nanotubes, MCM41 silica, these have cylindrical pores. Uh, 
even zeolites like AFI zeo type zeolite, which is uh, 12 membered rings uh, of 0.73 nanometer diameter, uh, they have uh, cylindrical or near cylindrical pores and can be modeled suitably uh, by a cylindrical pore idealization. Uh, however, to model the transport, you need to consider fluid solid interactions and the surface texture of the solid. We also have disordered materials such as carbons. Here's a uh, picture of an or a micrograph of a uh, carbon that we have uh, developed using uh, reverse Monte Carlo simulation. This is uh, silicon carbide derived carbon, and uh, it comprises crystallites with a 3D disordered structure of twisted sheets, as you can see here. It's usual to model transport in carbons by a slit pore model, but as I will show. The transport in such carbons is actually largely controlled by pore necks and structural constrictions. So you have cons constrictions within the structure that governs the transport. Adsorption can be calculated or determined based on the density uh, that you achieve in a slit pore, but not the transport. <coughs> then, of course, we have uh, zeolites, metal organic frameworks, and uh, ZIFs. All of these uh, generally have uh, cage window type structures and we cannot model them suitably uh, using idealized slit core or cylindrical core models. Here, we have to appeal to molecular dynamics simulation. In this uh, talk, I will not talk about molecular dynamics. It's a whole wide field by itself. Instead, I'll focus on models, tractable models that we can use for uh, simple systems. Uh, for these kinds of complex uh, or structures, we will uh, you actually have to do molecular dynamic simulation, or in some cases you can apply transition state theory as well. Now, molecular dynamic simulation is different from from uh, a theoretical model in the sense that in molecular dynamics you uh, put a large number of particles, a certain number of particles or molecules into your pore and solve the Newtonian equations of motion uh, for all the molecules uh, as they collide with each other, as they interact with each other, they interact with the pore surface. And from the trajectories of these molecules, you determine a transport coefficient through the mean square displacement uh, of the center of mass or of the individual molecules, depending on what, what kind of diffusivity you want. Uh, but MD is a special subject by itself, uh, which is not the subject of uh, today's talk. Here we're dealing with uh, analytical models. So what is the transport coefficient? We base the transport coefficient on the uh, standard irreversible thermodynamics based formulation in which we write the flux J <coughs> is equal to D naught rho over RT minus del mu, where D naught is our transport coefficient. T is of course temperature. Rho is the density, molar density or molecular density uh, inside your pores material in the pores. So this is equivalent of a concentration, but in the pores. And del mu is our chemical potential gradient. So minus del mu is the force in the diffusion direction. And this is the driving force. At low bulk pressure, you can write uh, del mu, so which is in the Henry's law region. Uh, at low pressure, you can write del mu as del ln Cb, where Cb is the bulk concentration. So Cb, is the concentration in the bulk gas that would be in equilibrium with the density rho in the solid. So the RT cancels once you make this substitution for del mu in terms of del ln Cb, and you have the equation here. And if you further differentiate log Cb, you will get d naught k del Cb, where d naught k, uh, where k is your equilibrium constant rho over Cb. And that can be evaluated uh, as the integral of E raised to minus V fluid solid, that's the fluid solid interaction energy divided by RT, a volume average of that over the, over the pole. So that's our equilibrium constant. And D naught is our diffusivity. So D naught K is somewhat like a Fickian diffusivity with the con bulk concentration gradient as the driving force. So this is at low pressure because we have made the assumption of uh, an ideal gas from del mu to del log Cd. At finite pressure, uh, one can define a Fickian diffusivity 
uh, such that j is d fig times minus del rho. And d fig from the top equation, the first equation, is always valid at every concentration, whether it's in the low pressure or high pressure region. We can determine that d fig is uh, d naught d log f by d log rho at constant temperature. And we write that as d naught gamma. This is the so called Darkin relation. And gamma is a thermodynamic factor, which is d log f by d rho. So I just wanted to put this so as to formally define uh, the the transport coefficient and put it into a thermodynamic perspective. Now that we know what it is, let's see how we can determine it in different kinds in, uh, as a function of pore size. Well, before we do that, we also should uh, sort of keep in mind what our goal is. Uh, the pore structure and network, network topology of most materials is complex. So we have idealized the pore shape. We, we idealize the pore shape, cylindrical or slit. Cylindrical is the most common assumption. Now. Most materials, particularly disordered materials, have a distribution of pore sizes. And this is, for example, a pore volume distribution. Before we can predict what's happening at the porous material, at the porous material level, we need to determine the diffusivity at various pore sizes so that we can average over this distribution. And uh, how we take an average will depend on the network, uh, and we'll talk about that in due course. Okay, now what is tortuosity? Tortuosity, as I mentioned, is related to the actual distance traveled uh, as a relative to the uh, net distance traveled in the diffusion direction. Let's look at, if you look at a single pore uh, in this uh, direction uh, uh, here, in that direction, and let's say that's the z-axis, which is the pore axis, it is at an angle theta, with the R axis, which is our net diffusion direction. So overall, our concentration driving force or our chemical potential driving force is applied between the top and bottom of this picture. So, and that's the direction, net direction. So the flux in the Z direction will be minus D of RP, D rho by DZ. Uh, and we now know exactly what this D of RP means. It's the diffusion coefficient, thick in diffusivity. Um, in a pore of radius RP. It turns out you can now, from here, you can obtain the net of uh, R direction flux in the pore, still in the pore, a unit pore area, as minus cos squared theta D of RP D rho by DR. You get one cos theta because DR, when a molecule moves a distance DZ, then DR will be DZ cos theta. So DZ is DR over cos theta, so you will get one cos theta. The second cos theta comes because the flux in the z direction has now got to be converted to that in the r direction and that component is cos theta so you get a second cos theta so you get minus cos squared theta so the net flux in this pore space over all the pores will be this is per unit area of the pore space is the average of minus cos squared theta d of rp times d rho by dr where we are assuming local equilibrium so that the rho is some kind of, kind of an average row in the structure at, at some position r. And uh, this is an average of cos squared theta over all orientations of the pore. And this is some average over all pore sizes. The spherical average of cos squared theta is one third. The probability distribution of theta is sine theta by two uh, in three dimensions. And so when you take that average, it comes out to be one third. So, and then th this being per unit area, you can convert per unit, uh, per air unit area of the pore, you can convert per unit area of the material by multiplying by the porosity epsilon. So we get this result for the net flux in the material, which implies a if effective diffusivity of epsilon D of RP bar uh, average D of RP over three. And we write that typically as epsilon D of RP or gamma, because three is an ideal value, the pore shape can be slightly different. Uh, and so to take into account uh, non-ideality and network effects, often we use gamma. <coughs> now, we can include a network effect within gamma. And this is something that uh, is not uh, usually discussed, but we showed that many, many years ago. Uh, the problem with the sine theta by two, which I mentioned is the probability distribution of, of uh, theta, is that uh, 
if a molecule, uh, so that's the uh, uh, sine theta by two is the probability distribution, assuming a completely random distribution over a sphere. Now, when a molecule has gone through a pore here, it has come to this intersection where uh, there, um, there are three additional pores. It can choose by chance collision, it, it, will, uh, it can choose to go into any one of these four pores. If it goes to one of these three pores on this side here, these are completely random and their probability distribution is sine theta by two. But if it by a chance collision uh, gets pushed into the spore where it has just come from, this spore is no longer random. It may have been random the first time it went through, but now there's a correlation. It's going back into precisely the same direction it came from. So when you take that into account, uh, the tortuosity is going to be three into n plus one into, uh, divided by n minus one, where n is the network coordination number the number of pores meeting at an intersection. You can see this makes very good sense, eminent sense. If n equal to one, what does that mean? It means all the pores are individual pores. They're not connected to each other. So if you place a molecule to a, in, a, to a, in a given pore, it goes to the end, it has nowhere to go. So it is stuck in that pore. They are not, in, uh, the, they are not uh, every node has only one pore. So the tortuosity will be infinite. It will not go anywhere, which is exactly what this predicts. So if you have, so with this expression, you have a better uh, understanding now of uh, tortuosity or a, or a more accurate way of representing tortuosity if you're modeling your pore structure through a network. For example, if n equal to three, you are going to get 12 by two, six, tortuosity is six. If n equal to four, you will have five by three, so your tortuosity is five. So you see your tortuosity is significantly higher than three, depending on what n is. A decent, usually a typical value of n is three or four is what we have found when we have fitted uh, data and we, uh, or we have interpreted data, not necessarily transport data, but even adsorption data where there are percolation uh, aspects coming into the picture. But we are not discussing that uh, in this talk. Uh, we won't bring in percolation theory. Now, as we have just seen, the diffusivity is determined using epsilon d of r bar r p bar by gamma. So there are two issues to resolve here. We have accounted for the effect of the network in gamma through that n plus one by n minus one factor. We now need to determine d of r p. How does the diffusivity vary with pore size? And then how do we average it to get d of r p bar? So let's talk about these two now, one by one. <coughs> the Traditional model for the diffusion in a single pore at low density is our Knudsen model, which is given by this equation. It assumes diffuse reflection and of course, low pressures. That's the low pressure model. So it assumes diffuse reflection. As a result, uh, and uh, this basically, it, it neglects fluid solid interactions. So as a result, all the trajectories are linear. Until the molecule actually collides to the surface, it doesn't know that there's a surface. There is no interaction between them. So the trajectory is linear. Now, in reality, because of van der Waals interactions, when a molecule has reflected off a pore, it's going to, uh, it's going to feel the attractive force of the surface. And so at some point, it is going to go back and collide uh, with the surface, get reflected again and go back. So the trajectories are curvilinear. I'm showing a side view. That's a cross-sectional view. In three dimensions, uh, when you have a straight pore, the molecule is going to undergo some kind of a curvilinear motion in all three directions. So how do you account for that? So uh, what my interest is in showing you how we can actually account for it and come up with an improved diffusivity. It's been shown that the Knudsen, we showed that the Knudsen equation and even Krishna that, that the Knudsen equation over predicts by as much as an order of magnitude. So let's examine this process of collision and the molecule colliding the wall and then executing a curvilinear motion, striking the wall again, and then being reflected again. Uh, we showed that the diffusivity for such a process is uh, the axial diffusivity will be given by KT over 2MK is the Boltzmann constant. M is the molecular mass. Uh, per molecule and tau is the average time, this, this uh, in brackets, the tau is the average time of a single trajectory. You have to average it over all possible uh, values of tau. The value of tau will depend on the kinetic energy of the molecule. The 
radial uh, momentum, the angular momentum, uh, and also the axial momentum. However, the axial momentum does not influence tau because you are assuming, we have assumed completely diffuse reflection. <coughs> so when a molecule reflects off the wall, it is completely diffusely reflected. And the tau for any trajectory depends on its energy, which is the fluid solid uh, potential energy, the uh, kinetic energy in the radial direction, the kinetic energy in the angular direction. That's the angular momentum P theta. Now, we have not included the Z momentum, as I said, because it's diffusely reflected and that doesn't influence this tau. We're assuming a one dimensional potential phi of R only in the radial direction. So it's axially averaged. Uh, this may sound like an imposing model and it uh, this actually is multiple integrals because the, I've written it in this form, but E has three components, a radial, uh, and then there's a radial uh, momentum and a radio angular momentum, and you have to integrate over all of these. So uh, rather, uh, rather than uh, make life difficult for every user and leave it as it is, we have actually fitted these, uh, having solved uh, for the diffusivity for various values, for a large number of values of the fluid solid interaction potential parameters, assuming canonical distributions of the um, kinetic energies, we can we have actually given convenient correlations for users uh, just before we i talk about the correlation let's take a look at how this kind of a diffusion uh, this kind of a model performs against molecular dynamics in this picture here i'm showing the transport coefficient of methane at 450 degrees as a function of pore diameter for a silica pore these points here, the symbols represent exact molecular dynamics results. And the solid curve, which matches it exactly, is our, uh, is our model uh, from here, uh, is this theory here. We call this the oscillator model. So that's the oscillator model. How, uh, and you can see there is exact match and we have tested it under numerous conditions for different gases and different pore sizes, of course, the pore sizes here, it works perfectly. It is an exact theory at low density, assuming diffuse reflection. What you see here, the Knudsen model, which is the upper, the upper straight line, is an order of magnitude too high. Now, there's two ways to handle the Knudsen model. Once you get to the atomic molecular level at the nano level, uh, the concept of a pore size becomes a little bit unclear. <clears throat> you can choose the pore size to be the uh, diameter uh, or the radius of the first layer of solid atoms, uh, which is this dark brown chocolatey colored uh, uh, atoms. So if that's the first layer of solid atoms, as you hit the pore surface, you can choose that to be the radius of the pore, that's RP. And this is when you do that, which is the conventional Knudsen model, because Knudsen model doesn't account for the surface texture, you get this. If instead you, there, you recognize that there's an excluded zone here because of the Van der Waals interactions, uh, because of the hard sphere interactions uh, between them. So if you take RK to be the inner circle where the closest approach atom of the fluid uh, can be, uh, that's the radius here. So it'll be RK will be RP minus approximately the Van der Waals interaction parameter between the fluid and the solid. <coughs> so, if we choose RK in, in R, we get this. So we are, in RK, we are taking into account the excluded region. You see that in this region at the very small pore sizes, you do extremely well, but still not good enough at the very low pore sizes. So here you have, you've taken into account the exclusion region, but you're still quite poor, an order of magnitude away, literally. So our oscillator model, uh, it gives us the exact diffusivity D naught at any RP, uh, which as I said, is an order of, up to an order of magnitude or even more depending on the gas and the temperature and the pore size, uh, significantly smaller than the actual, than the Knudsen diffusivity. So what we have done is provided convenient correlations for this diffusivity. D naught star is a dimensionless diffusivity at, uh, as a function of pore size. And uh, this D naught star is given as the actual D naught from the oscillator model divided by RP. Uh, 
which is the radius of the outer the of the first layer of solid atoms divided by square root of m over rt m is molecular weight and this is a function of the van der waals interaction parameters the two van der waals interaction parameters uh, are contained within these theta s and this uh, parameter psi theta s is defined as rt over n0 rho s sigma sf squared epsilon sf these are the um, leonard jones interaction parameters rho s is the solid density, N0 is the Avogadro number. And uh, the other parameter is RP or sigma SF. So for example, here is uh, in this figure, I have plotted D naught star versus RP or sigma SF uh, for various values of uh, this parameter. Oh, I seem to be losing my cursor. There's not, it's not behaving well. Okay, for various values of this uh, parameter, the, okay, for uh, various values of this uh, parameter, uh, theta s, so I've plotted this as one over theta s, and you can see this here, when, uh, so this one over theta s is given by this, rho s epsilon fs, rho s uh, sigma sf squared over kbt, and for various values of this, 0 0.176, 0 0.388, and so on, we have plotted the curves as a function of RP or sigma fs. Now, the top one is helium. Uh, uh, this 0 0.176 actually corresponds to helium at uh, 298. But the same curve also corresponds to uh, hydrogen at 656, that's the dash curve, that also corresponds to the same 0.176 also corresponds to hydrogen. And the bottom curve here is xenon at 298. All of these curves are 298 except hydrogen, uh, the dash one is at uh, 656 and the bottom uh, you have hydrogen, uh, 1.376 also corresponds to hydrogen at 84K. So you can see we have got a convenient way of uh, representing uh, our D naught star as a function of these two parameters, convenient correlations have been given and they are available in this uh, paper. So they're very easy to use and can actually be applied to experimental data as well uh, to calculate the diffusion coefficient if you're modeling a pore size, pore structure as a network of cylindrical pores. Now, once you know D naught, uh, the flux is always minus D naught K del CB as we showed. And D naught is, of course, uh, D naught star times square root of RT over M, for, as you can see from the first equation, uh, times del CV. And K is our equilibrium constant, which is the average over the of uh, E raised to minus phi FS over RT, for, that's the fluid solid interaction, over the uh, pore volume. Okay, let me try the pointer again to see if it uh, comes back. If not, we'll. Okay, we are back to business. So when adsorption is neglected, an experimental diffusive, diffusivity will usually be KD naught, as it will be based on the measured flux. So at low pressure in a single pore, uh, our uh, flux is D naught K del CB, which means that the effective diffusivity is epsilon times, because that's a single pore level, times average of KD naught over gamma, where gamma is our tortuosity. An experimentalist quite often just takes a Knudsen diffusivity and assumes uh, K equal to one. In other words, they don't account for the adsorption. They will simply base it on the bulk concentration uh, difference. And so they are assuming effectively epsilon DKN, RP bar or gamma. Uh, and uh, you have to take an average of D Knudsen uh, over, the, over the pore size distribution. And most usually, some kind of average pore size is taken. You take a representative pore size, which could be the mode of that pore size distribution where I drawn the pore size distribution, where the peak is, you take that. That's a quite a common way to do it. Now, and what an experimentalist will do is take uh, the fitted diffusivity, uh, effective diffusivity that you fit from your flux, experimental flux using this equation and plot against square root of T over M. And the linearity, uh, is assumed to be an indication or vindication of the uh, uh, Knudsen model.
So just because it is proportional to square root of P over M, the effective diffusivity uh, I will show is not a guarantee that the Knudsen model is valid. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's um, uh, let's take an example. Uh, I'm taking using the data of Gruner and Huber in Physical Review Letters, 2008. They reported the measured diffusivity, uh, which should be k d naught, to be proportional to square root of t over m. They measured helium in a silicon nano nanochannel, a reasonably cylindrical cylindrical uh, nanochannel they had constructed in helium. Uh, 12 nanometer diameter, and they measured a helium diffusivity between 40 and 300 K and found it to be proportional to square root of T over it. Then they measured the diffusivity of argon at 300 K and found that between helium and uh, argon at 300 K, this ratio was proportional to the square, inversely proportional to square root of molecular weights. So well and good, that's great. So um, one assumes it's the Knudsen model is valid because all of those uh, sort of uh, all the features of the Newton model, proportionality to square root of M, inversely to square root of M, proportionality to square root of temperature, they seem to be valid. <coughs> and in fact, they uh, said the measured diffusivity was 3.76 with a small error at 297K uh, and the D Newton at 297K in this pore for helium was, six, uh, was uh, five, millimeter squared per second, while the measured is 3.76. That means the measured is about 30% lower. The, so Knudsen was predicting about 30% higher than the measured value. And they, uh, they felt it was due to uh, non-idealities uh, in their construction uh, of the pore shape, surface roughness, et cetera. Well, let's assume that, uh, let's take into account that the diffusivity that you measure must really be KD naught as uh, I have just shown. So what we did was uh, use the oscillator model to calculate D naught and K from the uh, well, volume average of E raised to minus VFS of RT, calculated D naught K for helium for temperatures greater than 40 K and argon temperatures greater than 190 K and plotted them uh, versus the Knudsen diffusivity for these temperatures. Now, the Knudsen diffusivity is proportional to square root of T over M. Therefore, this is as good as plotting proportional to square root, uh, plotting against square root of T over M. So what you can see here is that all the argon points greater than 190K, which is the triangles, and all the helium points, they line up on a straight line very nicely, except at the very lowest temperatures where K is very high, the adsorption is very strong. So one could conclude from here that uh, that uh, it is proportional to square root of T over M because you have got both argon and helium on the same plot. But it turns out that the slope of this is 0.77, which means the Knudsen is over predicting by a factor of one over 0 0.77, which is about 30%. So I would say it's not necessarily due to poor shape, but essentially, the effect of the van der Waals forces, when you account for them, the D naught K is 30% lower than what you would expect from the Knudsen equation. So this really is a, in my opinion, a vindication or a validation of the oscillator model because the experimental data was very precise. 12 nanometer poor at, I mean, it's at the nanoscale where you don't directly often see such data which for pores of uh, precise, uh, single pore of precise nanoscale dimension. So what we can conclude is that the correlation of experimental diffusivity with square root of T over M is misleading and does not signify validity of the Knudsen model. One must consider the Van der Waals correlation, or Van der Waals uh, interactions uh, as the oscillator model does. Okay, now I'll come to this uh, role of surface texture. Fluid solid interactions also influence wall friction. With the Knudsen model, we assume that the, uh, the collision is completely diffuse, a reflection is diffuse, or if you're using the Navier-Stokes equations to solve for any kind of laminar flow uh, in a pore, we normally assume uh, no slip. Uh, 
Maxwell showed, in reality, these two boundary conditions will actually depend on uh, the surface roughness. So Maxwell showed, uh, or Maxwell defined a surface momentum accommodation factor alpha, such that a fraction alpha of the momentum is lost on wall collision. So when a molecule strikes a surface and it is reflected, then V reflected is V incident into one minus alpha because uh, alpha is the momentum lost. The incident one minus alpha is the retained momentum plus the lost momentum uh, is um, it's lost, but we have, because it's, a diff it's the diffusive part of the reflection, it is alpha times the uh, thermal velocity, which is a random velocity that you add on to it. So when alpha is one, this the first term is zero and you get V reflected as V thermal. That means it's completely diffuse reflection. You're getting uh, the thermal velocity. On the other hand, when alpha is zero, V reflected is V incident. It's a completely specular surface. Of course, in such a pore, which is completely specular, you cannot have a diffusivity, it'll be infinite because there is no friction with the wall. And there is, uh, if you apply a driving force, there's no opposing force and the molecules will just accelerate to infinity. Now, so it also turns out that smaller molecules are more diffusely reflected. Alpha for a smaller molecules is higher because it sees, it senses the surface texture better than a large molecule. The little crevices between the atoms can be sensed or felt a little more by the smaller molecule. So it will be more diffusely reflected. A large molecule will not sense the texture of the solid and it is likely to be more specularly reflected. So that's the sort of uh, uh, interpretation of what alpha is. Uh, Smolichowski mathematically showed D naught is two minus alpha or alpha D naught diffuse. So if you have the oscillator model uh, D naught, uh, which is our model with the Van der Waals interactions included, or if you want the Knudsen model D naught, uh, you have to multiply by two minus alpha over alpha and to get the real diffusivity for that surface. If alpha is one, this is two minus one over one. So D naught will be precisely the diffuse reflection model, oscillator model or the Knudsen model. If alpha goes to zero, as you can see, D naught goes to infinity because there's no friction at all. Most, most uh, surfaces are somewhere in between, depending on the kind of surface, it can be close to specular or it can be close to diffuse. <coughs> Uh, let's look at an example of carbon nanotubes. Uh, if you, we applied this equation to carbon nanotubes, we determine D naught for hydrogen and methane in a carbon nanotube uh, and of carbon nanotubes of various sizes. And we calculated D naught from molecular dynamics. So that's the exact D naught. Take into account the surface roughness because we have got it from MD. D naught oscillator is what we've got from the diffuse reflection theory. And so we backed out alpha. <coughs> we backed out alpha uh, out of uh, the, the two diffusivities, the oscillator model and the MD. Here I'm plotting Maxwell the, the reflection coefficient alpha as a function of the CNT diameter, uh, which we had done for various uh, CNT sizes. And that's hydrogen. And you can see the alpha lies here, it's for a 6, 6 CNT. <coughs> it is of the order of uh, two to three times 10 to minus four. For a 12, 12 CNT, which is close to 1.6 nanometer diameter, it comes close to uh, 10 to minus two. So in, in, all, in, in, in any case, regardless of the size, it's very far from being diffuse. It's nearly specular for 6, 6, only a small amount of friction, which is why you might've heard why nanotubes are so smooth and, uh, and transport is so rapid because the moment surface momentum uh, accommodation factor is low. And the reason it is low for carbons is because the carbon atoms are tightly packed together with only 1.4 angstrom distance. Atoms or molecules, when they strike a surface, they are of the order of three to four angstrom size. <coughs> Excuse me. So they tend to almost see the surface as a smooth surface. The carbon atoms are so tightly packed together. Now, I also mentioned that a small molecule has sees, it, uh, sees the surface as rougher. Uh, so its alpha will be higher. Well, here's CH4, 
uh, which I had done uh, quite some time back. This work is more recent, uh, 2021. The, this is CH4, which I had done along with David Scholl uh, and a student, Harbin Chen, in 2005. Uh, we found the alpha using exactly the same method, using molecular dynamics for D0, D0 oscillator on the right side, we calculated alpha for CH4 is closer to six or seven into 10 to the minus four, as opposed to for a 10, 10 nanotube, as opposed to uh, something which is six or seven into 10 to the minus three, an order of magnitude less. And that's because uh, CH4 views the, or perceives the carbon nanotube surface as being very smooth. So this is an important factor. However, there's no theory to, uh, convenient theory to give alpha. Ultimately, we have to get alpha from molecular dynamics, just like I have shown here. But if we are doing that, we might as well use the molecular dynamics D0 in our calculations. Uh, it, uh, if you're going to do MD, you're getting the D0 anyway. So backing out the alpha using this method is really something for, um, from an, uh, um, uh, useful to understand things, but we do not have a way to predict alpha. So ultimately you have to appeal to D0 from molecular dynamics. Uh, Okay, I will stop, take a break at this time and uh, answer any questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, so there are some questions. Um, the first one is that when, when you decided the, uh, the network uh, number, and right. so how, how was that uh, network coordination number and determined? Okay, <clears throat> one way we, when we determined it in some systems is uh, we looked at the adsorption of uh, molecules of different sizes. Uh, just the adsorption, uh, uh, the, the adsorption equilibrium. And uh, we, uh, when, when the pores are significantly sm are smaller than the molecular size, they are not going to, the, those molecules will not enter, right? So when you look at the uh, adsorption isotherms for molecules of different sizes, you have to use percolation theory to calculate what is the fraction of pores that are accessible uh, to this given molecule of a certain size. And, and those are the, the pores larger than that size. What are the accessible, what is the accessible fraction? So from percolation theory, you can calculate the accessible fraction and that accessible fraction is depending on N. So we did that with some carbons. Uh, and I would suggest you read the papers of uh, my papers with Ismadji, I-S-M-A-D-J-I, Ismadji and Bhatia. Uh, many years ago, uh, you will, if you do a, a reference check, uh, you will find papers uh, where we, you have used percolation theory and calculated values of N uh, from adsorption isotherms. That is one way. Uh, another way could be by fitting uh, kinetic data, but if you could, uh, but you would need very accurate data for it. I think the best way is percolation theory and studying the adsorption of molecules of different sizes. Thank you. Uh, Arvind had one question. So in the literature, uh, we see toxicity values much higher than three. So Correct. how do we uh, reconcile this? That's exactly sort of sort of. Let's uh, let me go back to uh, my uh, that slide. Yes. So the way to reconcile this would be to from uh, the large value uh, to calculate n back back out n, right? For example, if you get a tortuosity of six, that means uh, you will find n equal to three. n equal to three predicts tortuosity of six, right? Four by three times three, uh, four by two times three, so that's six. So if you get a tortuosity of five, it means n equal to four. So depending on what value of tortuosity you get, you can back out n. But of course, to back out tortuosity, you also need a good model for D of RP bar. If we are using, uh, uh, sort of arbitrarily choosing a, a mean pore size and then calculating D of RP, uh, D, D at that mean pore size, uh, 
Uh, you can still try this approach, but uh, may not necessarily work. What my experience is that if you choose an, a, a single RP, not average over the distribution, or any, but just evaluate D at the mode of the distribution, uh, which is here. If you evaluate D at this point, at this value, uh, then uh, you will usually get a low tortuosity, not a high tortuosity. But when you average over the whole distribution, do it well, do it correctly, then how we average over the distribution, I will talk about. But if you do that right, then you will get a tortuosity larger than three. And one should be, then be able to back out N. And um, there is another question. Uh, so on your slide 11, so the helium, uh, helium curve is overlapping with hydrogen at 85. Yeah. This is slide 12. Okay, let me go yeah, back. Previous one. Yes. 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 So <laughs> why they are overlapping almost exactly? They are. Uh, I chose the temperature for. Uh, Helium is uh, 298, and I chose a temperature of uh, hydrogen uh, such that you had the same value uh, of this parameter, uh, uh, rho s epsilon squared sigma f over kbt, right? So one over theta s. So the two have the same value of theta s. Ultimately, d naught star is a function of theta s and the parameter uh, psi, which is rp over sigma f s. I may not be pronouncing that parameter, that value correctly, that variable correctly, but RP or sigma FS. It's a function of two parameters. For the same values of the two parameters, regardless of the gas, the curves will overlap because that's D not star on the, on the y-axis. Oh. Right? Okay. So similarly, uh, hydrogen at uh, 84K, the very bottom curve here, uh, that bottom curve overlaps with uh, xenon at... Uh, Xenon at 298K. <clears throat> the what matters is the value of RP or sigma and theta S. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what, uh, all we have for now. So if uh, we want, uh, if we have more uh, questions, we can ask at the end of the seminar. Okay. okay. My uh, laser is misbehaving again. Let me go back to the cursor and uh, then we. We'll Try it later again. Okay. So I'll go to the second part of the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Good. <coughs> okay. We have now uh, looked at transport uh, at low density in single pores and seen how uh, we can calculate, we can incorporate Van der Waals interactions to get uh, a good value of the diffusivity. At higher densities, at our at uh, higher pressures, you have interaction between the fluid molecules. So now uh, we need a better theory, a different theory. The standard theory is the uh, uh, is the dusty gas model of uh, Mason et al. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with it, which is the equation at the top. Let me see if the pointer works now. It seems to uh, want to give up after a while, but then come alive as it is now. Okay. So this equation at the top uh, is basically a force balance. This is the, the, the leftmost term is the driving force. And this is the viscous force. This is the friction between, frictional force between different species. Vi minus Vj bar, this is the mean value of uh, velocity of species I, mean velocity of species J. The difference is the relative velocity and the friction would clearly be proportional to that. So one over dij is representative of a friction coefficient. This was shown by Einstein long ago uh, that kt over d is a friction coefficient. That's the Einstein formulation. And so uh, this term, when you sum over all the species j, it gives you the friction between species i and all other species. So the net frictional force, intermolecular frictional force acting on i. Uh, so that's this term and uh, this last term is the VI, VI bar is the velocity of species I. And uh, since you have, and this is the diffusivity in the, uh, in the solid itself of species I. So while well, this is the mutual diffusivity, Dij. So this is the diffusivity in the solid. And so this term gives you the friction with the solid. Uh, 
So you have, this is our force balance. The viscous term plus the driving force is the intermolecular friction and this friction with the solid. So this is the dusty gas model often applied to uh, mesopores and macropores. So you have viscous flow plus molecular diffusion plus wall effects, all of them included in this. You all know the Maxwell-Stefan equation uh, model of Krishna. I didn't put a reference here because he's got dozens, maybe hundreds, hundreds of references, papers in this area. We call it the Maxwell-Stefan model. Uh, it basically applies a similar one, but doesn't have the viscous force. Uh, which makes sense for nanopores because at nanopores, uh, the solid fluid interactions uh, are very important and uh, fluid solid interactions are less important. So the viscous terms can be neglected in most cases. But what I will show is that actually this equation, the top equation, Mason's equation is incorrect. You don't need a viscous force in here. It should not be there. Uh, so, for the viscous term, <clears throat> if you make this substitution, V bar, which is the mean velocity, B naught is the permeability. If you go back to uh, this equation here, B naught is the permeability. This is the diffusivity in the pore for that species I. Eta is the viscosity, rho I is the density of species I, and this is the pressure gradient. So this is the viscous force. Now, if you make the substitution, which is, uh, uh, which is involved in even in development of this equation that B naught over eta dp by dz is our velocity. This is the velocity of species uh, of any species. So for species i, that's the velocity. Uh, <clears throat> with uh, let me go back again here. Yeah, so that's uh, B naught, and um, so that's the mixture velocity. Sorry, that's the mixture velocity. B naught over eta dp by dz is the mixture velocity. So when you make the substitution, you ultimately, because this is uh, in the last equation, this is multiplied by rho over dip. When you make that substitution for V bar, you and you collect together the terms, that viscous term now comes within this. Now, have an, uh, let's have a look at this. Let's sort of break this equation down. That's our driving force. This is This must be matched when you look at the pore as a whole, all viscous forces are internal. So you don't, uh, you just, uh, uh, if you draw your control volume over the fluid in the pore, you only need to worry about, uh, for any species I, you need to worry about the force of all the other species and the force of the wall. So this is the force due to the friction of the other species. And as I said, uh, Einstein defined our friction coefficient as KT or Dij. <clears throat> now, this is the relative velocity of species I relative to the mixture. And that's where the problem is. If you are to have a friction with a wall, the relative the velocity here must be the velocity of the species I relative to the wall, not relative to the mixture velocity. So Krishna is absolutely right in neglecting this, not just because viscous forces are small in nanobores, but it's theoretically unsound to have it here. That Mason equation was arbitrarily just written as a force balance, not really uh, accounting, uh, not <coughs> uh, taking all factors into consideration. Uh, and when you properly analyze it, you'll find that this is unnecessary. It should be simply rho i vi bar over dip. That's the wall effect, that's the mutual diffusion. And this is the friction force from all the other species. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, there is an assumption here that you just have one density in the pore. In reality, you have a velocity, which is a velocity gradient in the radial direction, and you have a density profile in the radial direction. By simply using the overall velocity of the pore and by using a single density rather than a density profile, we are oversimplifying. We could be oversimplifying the problem. Uh, we have developed another model, uh, which I, which is somewhat superior to the, uh, to one using a uniform density and a uniform velocity. And uh, this here is our frictional model. Let me go back again. I think I'll. Was... Okay. So the first term here 
is our viscous part here. Eta I is the partial viscosity of species I. Now, the partial viscosity of species I has been shown to be the weight fraction of species I times eta, which is the mixture viscosity. That's our driving force. This is now, you know, the frictional force with the other species. And we write the frictional force with the wall in this way, take into account, now this becomes these, this is the total density in the pore or total concentration as a function of R. And this is a function of R. These profiles can be obtained by density functional theory, standard density functional theory, or Monte Carlo simulation. If it is a molecular uh, fluid, you can obtain these profiles. And uh, this frictional force um, is derived in a, is written in a very special way. Uh, if you look at a molecule that is diffusing uh, or that is moving in the radial direction in a pore, as it moves towards the wall, it comes to a point of minimum potential, that's the potential energy curve. And then it goes up the against the uh, potential gradient. In other words, it is in the repulsive region of the wall. And this is where at some point due to the repulsion, it reverses direction and goes back into the pore. So uh, we assume that the frictional force that the wall exerts is distributed over this region between the potential minimum and the point where it returns, uh, turns back uh, in the radial direction. <clears throat> and, and at this point, uh, if it was uh, diffusely reflected, it has lost all its axial momentum. And if it is uh, not diffusely reflected, it uh, diffusely reflected has uh, lost part of its axial momentum. So uh, one can solve this equation uh, if you specify the friction coefficient with the wall. Rho i is uh, derived from, uh, say, Monte Carlo simulation of the adsorption, or if it's an uh, if it's an atomic fluid or a spherical fluid from simple density functional theory. Vi bar is the mean velocity of species i, and because it is occurring only after the frictional force works only after the potential minimum, we have this as a step function, unit step function, r minus r zero i, that's the location, the potential energy minimum. Once you solve this equation, I'll discuss the boundary conditions in a moment. Uh, once you solve this equation, you can obtain the um, Onsager coefficients. I thought I'd converted it to L. This should be Lij rather than omega ij to be consistent with my graphs. That's the Onsager coefficients times minus delta, uh, minus del mu j. So you can, from the solution of this, you can obtain the Onsager coefficients. Now, what are the boundary conditions to that equation? Uh, you have zero shear stress at the center, which is, uh, we are used to that condition. Now, we do not use the no-slip boundary condition, which I said at the nanoscale uh, is not good. Instead, we say zero shear stress at the uh, at the radial position of the first layer of solid atoms. This is where you have zero shear stress because you have no gas penetrating that far. The density profile of the gas as you get uh, close into the solid is just going to drop to zero very quickly. These are soft sphere interactions when you use a Van der Waals interaction. <coughs> so. And in the low density limit, we have shown that the friction coefficient is given by this. So D naught I uh, is the LD is the low density diffusivity or species I, which could be from the oscillator model if it is completely diffusely reflected, or you could have it multiplied by two minus alpha over alpha. And so this uh, KT over that is the friction uh, in the whole uh, pore for the fluid I. But that would be the whole pore is between zero and R. We are distributing it between R zero I and R over the uh, molecules of the fluid between R zero I. That means the potential energy minimum and R. So we are distributing the friction not of uh, in in this in this region here after the potential minimum. Okay and. Now, psi, I, the friction coefficient is taken to be independent of density. Here's a figure of the Onsager coefficients, uh, Lij, 
I call that LIJ in this. I had uh, corrected that I must be using a uh, on a different uh, on a different computer. I think I'd corrected it. I forgot to put port it here. Anyhow, we are. Uh, uh, this is the solid line. Is the result of the theory here for L11. Uh, we have two gases, two species in the mixture, in the bulk mixture, uh, hydrogen and methane. One is hydrogen, two is methane. <coughs> So uh, this is L11 from the theory and this dots, uh, the symbols are from simulation. You can see very good agreement here. And this is L22, the, curve, the second curve here, which is the dash dot curve is L22. Theory and simulation matching perfectly. And this is for a silica pore of diameter 1.57 nanometer with an adsorbed density of hydrogen of 0.25, and we are plotting against adsorbed density of methane in the pore. And this is L12, because you have three LIJs uh, when you have a binary mixture, L11, L12, L22. That omega that I showed should really be L in that previous slide. So, uh, and this is the uh, cross, inter cross parameters, L12, or, and which is the same as L21. Uh, for L12 and L21, you do have a reasonably larger uh, error bar from the simulations, uh, but the theory goes right through it. Similarly, for uh, when you increase the hydrogen concentration in the pore, uh, you still are matching at one, and this is the result at, uh, theory, at four. They are matching beautifully. On the other hand, if you assume uniform density, as is uh, used in the conventional Maxwell-Stefan theory of Krishna, and in most other models where they neglect any, we do not consider the radial density gradients. Uh, if you were to assume a uniform profile, uniform profile, yep, yeah, uniform density along the radius for both methane and hydrogen, you obtain considerable mismatch. That's L11. Those are the symbols. Similarly, uh, L22. L12 is very much off. Now we obtained the, uh, for the mixture, uh, uh, D11, D22 could be easily obtained just from the, the we, this is completely diffuse reflection. So we got this from the oscillator model. D12 was obtained from bulk simulations, simulating, doing molecular dynamic simulations on the bulk fluid. That means no solid, we obtained D12. And I must mention that in this theory, uh, the uh, the viscosity eta and these diffusivities are calculated at a locally average density. In other words, these are functions of the density, but we, uh, we are considering a, a low, when I say locally average density, averaged over one molecular diameter of species I, in this case for Dij, over one molecular diameter. Similarly, this uh, is averaged over one molecular diameter or the mixture density here. This is a function of the mixture density. It is uh, averaged, uh, each species density is rho i, rho j, they are, or rho one, rho two, they are averaged over one molecular diameter. So this is what is called the local average density model. And it's discussed in, in the papers that I have referred to here. So you see a theory like this, which takes into account the density profile uh, is much more accurate than one that assumes uniform density. Now, so now we know how to uh, actually develop the multi-component transport model in a single pore of arbitrary size. How do we now average it over the pore network? That's the second part of our uh, sort of our quest to determine the effective diffusivity. The effective diffusivity is given by this DE is epsilon n minus one over three into n plus one D of RP bar, right? Uh, where three into n plus one by three n minus one is our tortuosity. So we need to determine D of RP bar, take into account uh, the network properties. Some properties of the network are already taken into account through n of the tortuosity, uh, but we need to also look at how the network influences this averaging process. The most usual way is to integrate D of RP over the pore size distribution F of RP. That's the pore volume distribution. And so you divide here outside the integral by the total pole volume and you get D of RP, which means you are assuming 
all the capillaries are in parallel. It's a parallel network of capillaries, which we know not uh, to be not to be uh, exact. Uh, it's approximate. So we need to consider if you want to consider network effects and connectivity effects, we've got to uh, come up with a better way of doing it. Uh, the tortuosity has some aspects of the network effect uh, through this coordination number n, but that only considers orientation effects. What about for the diffusivity? You have closed loops. And uh, when a molecule comes in here, it has the chance of going into any of these. What is the probability that it goes into one and not the other? And so on. Those factors will, uh, will come into the picture when we talk about network connectivity effects. This n minus one and n plus one assumes that all pores have the same conductance. So for pores that have a uniform conductance, uh, we have this formula three into n plus one by three into n minus one for the tortuosity. Okay, so how do we incorporate network effects in D? Uh, long ago, 1973, Kirkpatrick for random networks of resistors, he showed that you can you develop what is called an effective medium theory to get what is the effective value of every resistor in that network of resistors. So if you imagine, so he was looking at an electrical conduction problem. So you have this network, each one of this is an independent resistor, each one having a conductivity lambda. Each resistor has a conductivity lambda and there's a distribution of lambdas. What Kirkpatrick said was replace every one of these conductors by an equivalent conductor having uh, a uniform conductivity lambda E. So each one of these resistance resistors has the same conductivity lambda E. And he, um, uh, the, uh, the problem he posed was, what is the effective value lambda E? What is the lambda E, the effective conductance, such that every resistor has the same value lambda E? Uh, so what is the effective conductance of this network? So what he showed was that if you take a number average of lambda minus lambda e or lambda plus n by two minus one lambda e, you take and set that equal to zero, you you get a nonlinear equation for lambda e which you can solve. <coughs> so that's the effective uh, equivalent effective con uh, equivalent conductivity for every resistor in that network, and these are random networks. One can apply that to pores. And uh, this uh, has been done um, initially by uh, Ted Davis and Mohamed Sahimi in, um, at Minnesota many, many years ago. Uh, and what, uh, what is done is to define the conductance of every pore in this network. For any pore of radius RP, the conductance can be defined in this way. That's the cross-sectional area. And this is the diffusivity. The conductance of a resistor in any network will be the conductivity multiplied by the cross-sectional area divided by its length. And so KD0 is our effective diffusivity for a pore. And so this becomes the conductance of a pore. And uh, so if you have a pore volume distribution F of RP, the number of pores of between radius RP and RP plus PRP will be F of RP divided by F of pi RP squared L DRP where L is the pore length. We assume that to be uniform. All the pores are of uniform length. And uh, you set that to zero, you can solve for lambda E, where lambda is defined in this way. Let me try the pointer again. Okay, so lambda is defined in this way. So one can solve this equation. Uh, and I want to note here that L does not really enter into the picture because you can take L and multiply by lambda and you will get the product lambda EL here. If you multiply top and numerator and denominator by L, being, which is constant, uh, you will get L lambda E from here. L, since this is zero, L does not matter, but you can obtain the solution lambda to lambda E. Once you know the effective conductance or equivalent conductance of every, res every pore, the current through the pore is lambda E times minus del CB. Current is always conductance times the uh, potential difference or potential difference divided by resistance. So here, we, we, one of our resistance is conductance. So that's lambda E. So the flux in the material can now be given as the flux in the pore 
or the current in the pore divided by the area of the pore, and then you take an average of the area over the porous medium, over all the pores. That's the pi rp squared average. We obtain lambda EL from here, and you're dividing by the uh, tortuosity because this is the pore current. You have to divide by the tortuosity in the network. And the tortuosity we know now to be given by this here, 3n plus 1 by 3 by n minus 1. And epsilon is, of course, the porosity, as usual, because you're going from per unit pore area to the medium epsilon. As I mentioned, the value of L is not required. So this equation can be conveniently applied. Now, I have not I, uh, given examples of use of this, uh, of this equation, but I have provided a list of references for those uh, who are interested uh, in applying this model. Um, effective medium theory to their porous material and to interpret their transport data. There's a list of references which you can see uh, later on. Okay, so let me carry on. <coughs> what we have now done is uh, seen how we can determine the transport coefficient in a network, which means uh, in, uh, in sort of uh, in a porous material um, or in a given phase of a porous material uh, in which you know the pore size distribution. Real materials quite often are modeled as, uh, as having grains, which are uh, uh, sort of uh, aggregated together to form the large particle, to form a large particle. So in a given grain, you have diffusion uh, uh, through the pores within that grain. And then you will have also through the particle scale diffusion, through the large pores between the grains. So one generally has a two equation model. Um, in the macroporous network, you have a equation like this. This gives you the flux into the grains. This uh, C mu is the concentration profile within the grain, within the grain. So, and you have an equation for diffusion within the grain here. So you have a DE mu, which is a diffusivity in the network inside the grains. And DEM is the diffusivity of that pore network outside the grains or between the grains. That Those pores between the grains, they have an effective diffusivity DEM. So this represents the flux. DEM mu, DC mu by DR represents a flux into the grain surface. And of course, because you're going from the macropores, uh, the fraction um, or the surface area of the grains has to be multiplied by one minus epsilon m because that's the uh, volume fraction of the grains to give you per unit volume of the whole material. On the surface of the grains, you will, uh, uh, of the particle, you will have Cm of R0 at the outer surface here. So at the outer surface, you will have uh, equilibrium with the bulk. And because these are macropores, you assume this is the bulk concentration. Otherwise, you will have an isotherm. And at the center of the particle, you have dcm by dr uh, equal to 0, the usual boundary condition at the center. And within the grain, you have a similar condition that the gradient is 0 at the center. But at the surface of the grain, you have equilibrium with the macropores. So you need an isotherm model as well for the grains. So this is a very popular model. And uh, while we can obtain the diffusivities in the two networks, uh, the macropore and the micropore network, theoretically using the concepts I've discussed, in many cases, you fit them to uptake kinetics data, particularly when shape and other non-idealities are important. OK, I'll give you an example of use of this. Uh, which we have done not too long ago, recently, we had the we made the silicon carbide derived carbon in our lab uh, by chlorinating silicon carbide. <coughs> you get the microporous carbon, and we then characterized it by um, by neutron scattering and used reverse Monte Carlo simulation to get these uh, to back out the structure. So this is what the structure looks like, and we did this with. Uh, silicon carbide particles, uh, starting silicon carbide particles of 50 nanometer diameter. The pore volume distribution uh, 
of that is given here. The dash dot curve line is the 50 nanometer diameter particles. We wanted to study the uh, kinetics of gas adsorption inside this material. We found it very hard to work with the 50 nanometer particles because they kept getting sucked into the apparatus. They're so light. So uh, whenever we tried to evacuate. So we then went to, uh, got new samples, uh, starting with 0.6 micron silicon carbide, which you obtained from alpha azar and another 20 micron particles from sigma Ulrich. So being from different sources and prepared in different ways, you expect they'll have different impurities. So the transport coefficients may not necessarily uh, match and the structures may be slightly different. In fact, the 0.6 and the 0.20, they had closely somewhat similar structures, but the 50 nanometer had some small uh, ultra micropores, even which were even smaller than what we saw in the others. But the 0.6 and 20 were what we actually did experiments with. So when we uh, looked at the diffuse, uh, at the uptake in the 0.6 and 20 micron particles, uh, uh, we got curves like this. They were very fast. Diffusion was very fast. This is a 0.6 micron particle diffusion is, is very fast. And uh, we uh, we could fit only after significant amount of uptake had occurred. So when we fitted the curve after uh, say 60% uptake or so, uh, we could get the two diffusion coefficients in the macro macropores and in the micropores. Now, if we tried to fit a single diffusivity, a single di diffusion equation, a diffusion equation with just one diffusion constant, we got curves like this, the dashed curves and dashed dot curve and nowhere near the actual curve. This, uh, the second one, uh, the two equation models fitted well. From there, we got the diffusion coefficient in the grains, the ultra micropores. Uh, and that's the, uh, the blue one is the 0.6 micron particle, and that's the 20 micron particle. So the, when I, uh, so this is d mu naught. You can, because of the nature of the diffusion equation, uh, we do not exactly know uh, the, uh, in this, uh, we do not exactly know uh, the uh, size of this particle of the grain. We do not know. So uh, when you solve these equations in dimensionless form, you will find that, <coughs> you get this parameter d mu naught over rg squared, which is the diffusivity inside divided by the size of the grain squared. And that is what you can extract from the data. You cannot get d mu naught directly. But this is a, quite a small quantity. rg typically is going to be in these uh, of the order of uh, 30, 40 nanometers, uh, we could sense uh, just from uh, transmission electron microscopy. And so that means that the, this d mu naught is of the order of 10 to the minus 17. And you cannot even simulate that with molecular dynamics. It's just way too slow. However, for the 0.6 and 20 micron particles, we found the particle scale diffusion coefficient, the long range diffusion coefficient to be pretty close. And this is what we got here. The pink curves, violet curves are with an activation energy of 15.6 kilojoules are for 0.6 micron particles. And for 22.8 micron particles, we had these blue uh, triangles, but they are very close to each other, which was quite satisfying given that they are from different sources. The 0.6 and the 22 micron, they come from different sources. One was from Sigma, the other from ASAR. They would have different impurity. They had different impurities also. So we would expect they would have slightly different structures uh, from the 50 nanometer particle, which we use to get the uh, this here, the actual atomic structure of the carbon. So now we then, in any case, we use the atomic structure, this atomic structure, atomistic structure, to do molecular dynamics and calculated the diffusivities of methane. And what you get here is this here, these symbols, the circles. Uh, Pretty, which are pretty close to and uh, to what we experimentally got, or or what we got from interpretation of experimental data. So, which tells us that our reverse Monte Carlo uh, uh, Monte Carlo structure is reasonably good, at least in representing the transport coefficient of methane. Uh, 
Now, we use quasi-electron uh, elastic neutron scattering uh, to get uh, to measure the diffusivity, which is way too higher. But QANS is well known to uh, be valid only over one or two nanometers. It just does not, uh, <clears throat> and we did that with 20 micron particles. It cannot simulate long range motion. In the particles, uh, we are talking of 20 micron, 0.6 micron particles. Uh, it cannot simulate that, mo it cannot measure motion at that scale. Now, the point here I want to make is uh, that uh, what is this diffusion here that we are experimentally measuring? What is that governed by? If you look at slit pore, the slit pore model is common, is commonly used for diffusion in carbons to, uh, to estimate diffusivity uh, theoretically. But uh, here I'm showing data of methane adsorption at 298 in carbon slit pores of different width at different pressures, three different pressures. What you find is uh, at one bar, for example, uh, which is where we worked at, the diffusivity is of the order of maybe, this is 10 to the minus six, of so the order of 10 to the minus seven. So the diffusivity is of the order of 10 to the minus seven going up to 10, and this is 10 times, 20 times, or 10 to the minus six. So we are of the diffusivities of the order of 10 to the minus six. On the other hand, the diffusion coefficient that we measured is of the order of 10 to the minus nine to, uh, or so, about a hundred to a thousand times smaller. You can put a factor of 10 or so due to tortuosity and epsilon, because this is based on single pore, uh, but you cannot explain the factor of 100 to 1,000. Even surface roughness uh, uh, will not explain it, because uh, uh, this is with a very small alpha. Remember, I showed carbons have very small alpha. So this is with a very small alpha. Even if we put in an alpha which is uh, 10 times larger, you're not going to come anywhere near this 100 to 1,000 factor uh, difference. And so the only explanation is that it's constrictions within this pore structure that are governing the diffusion. So the ideal slit pore model, it's useful for adsorption because the pore volume of a slit pore uh, is not affected by constrictions or by uh, surface roughness. So you can predict adsorption well but not necessarily transport. This is where molecular dynamics and a good knowledge of the structure will come in. All right, now I'm coming to the last part uh, of my talk and which is the kind of work we are doing most recently, which, which is the effect of finite system size. As I mentioned, the diffusion coefficients that you calculate uh, using the Knudsen model or the oscillator model, they are valid far away from the boundary. They do not recognize the presence of the boundary. So when fluid enters a pore, it will undergo a small uh, period in which the fluid develops and it equilibrates and comes to some equilibrated, equilibrated flow within that material. So there will be what is called an entry length. <clears throat> for example, for laminar flow in large tubes, it's been determined that the entry length is 0 0.075 D times RE. So, uh, uh, RE is the Reynolds number. For, uh, for laminar flow, the maximum Reynolds number is 2000. That means you're talking of 150 diameters or 300 radii, two radii. That's the length. It turns out we found that uh, in, in nanopores, it's the factor is much, much larger. So uh, if you're talking of ultra thin membranes, uh, nanoscale uh, sized materials, the diffusion coefficient will be very different from what you get in, in uh, using molecular dynamic, conventional molecular dynamics or the, some of the theories that are talked about because of the entry length. And so the interface, so what will happen if you have a large, uh, large enough material, this region in which the flow is developing will provide, will effectively show up as an interfacial resistance. So um, this interfacial resistance can be given as the excess resistance of the pore compared to the value if the pore had the same diffusivity as an infinitely large pore. In other words, the R interface will be L over A rho D not internal. D not internal is the diffusion coefficient in this finite nanomaterial. If now you had instead the diffusivity of the infinitely large material, 
then this would be the resistance. And the difference is the excess resistance of this finite material. If you take L over V naught int as out, A rho, A rho D naught int as out, you get this factor in which is the relative resistance because that's the resistance of the material, the finite material of length L, that's the actual resistance. So this you will get as a relative uh, resistance and this is the interfacial resistance, basically relative to the total resistance of the material. This excludes external resistances due to external mass transfer. Existing models assume long, infinitely long capillaries and are only applicable far from the boundaries as I mentioned. What difference does it, how, how important is all of this? Here I'm showing molecular dynamics results for an infinitely large CNT. So how do we do an infinitely large CNT using molecular dynamics? Basically you make it periodic. You might have a 10 nanometer CNT as your unit cell, and then you make it periodic. So this is where uh, the diffusion coefficient is. And this is for methane at 300 K. The diffusivity is of the order of 50 to 100, say 60, 70 uh, times, uh, this is nanometer squared per picosecond. Okay, if you have a 10 nanometer long CNT, so this is no longer periodic, it's just 10 nanometers long, that's your diffusion coefficient. You can see is uh, 40, uh, about now more like a couple of hundred times less, three, 400 times less than that of the infinite material. If you have a hundred nanometer tube, a CNT, and this is all 10, 10 CNTs, it's of the order of, let's say 0.1 to 0.3, as opposed to about 70. So that's, uh, you can see this about, in fact, uh, 0.1. So that's about 200 or 300 or so, right? Times smaller. So uh, there's a huge difference and a very big effect of size, which surprised us. If you did density functional theory or Monte Carlo simulation, and you looked at the density profile at the entrance of the tube, you will find that the density profile sharply changes from that of the bulk gas to that deep inside the tube within a nanometer or so. So this change in the density profile is not an explanation for this. If we examined it deeper, to examine it deeper, we looked at uh, density uh, diffusivity profiles within the tube. So if this is your tube and there's a certain region which we call the entry length, we found that the diffusion coefficient varied with position in these, uh, in these regions. Inside, after the entry length, the diffusion coefficient is more or less the same as the infinitely long tube. So this is the tube and this is the distance in which the flow is adjusting. So I'm plotting here D naught over D naught infinity uh, versus position for tube for uh, tubes of different length. And what we did to understand the effect of surface roughness, if that affects the entry length, we uh, changed the distance, uh, interatomic distance of the carbons on a nanotube. 0.1418 is the exact distance of a proper carbon nanotube. That's 1.4 angstroms. We decreased it to 0 0.12 from, uh, and we also increased it to 0.17 and 0.21. What you find is with 0 0.12, which would be a smoother tube, right? The distance between the carbon atoms is smaller. And when we uh, change this distance, the diameter changes. So to keep the diameter same, we change the N, uh, which is the, the chiral vector of the carbon nanotube from a 10, 10, from this uh, 0.81 corresponds to 6, 6 nanotube. And to get to 0.1, <coughs> you have to, uh, uh, you will then uh, change the diameter of the nanotube. Similarly, when it is 0.21, you will also, uh, the diameter will change. It will decrease or increase uh, depending on whether the interatomic spacing is decreased or increased. So now, but these are all tubes of 0.81 nanometer diameter. What you find here is that with 0.12, which should be a smoother tube, the carbon atoms are tightly packed together. The diffusion coefficient uh, at the center 
and this is a one micron tube, 1000 nanometer uh, at the center is only about maybe 0 0.03 as compared to the infinite tube. So it's 30 times smaller. On the other hand, when the roughness is very high, the distance between the carbon atoms is increased to 0.21 nanometer or 2.1 angstroms. It reaches close to one at the center. This is a roughly 300 nanometer tube and close to 150, or sorry, 240 nanometer tube, close to 120 or so. Uh, nanometer at the center is this. So you can say about 120 nanometer is the entry length for this tube. Here, the entry length is very large for the 1.4, uh, the actual carbon nanotube. Even with, with a one micron tube, you are maybe roughly 10% of the diffusion coefficient. You have 10% of the diffusion coefficient of the infinite tube. So in carbon nanotube, you can see that the entry length is going to be, uh, if it is uh, um, for a point, point 0.81 nanometer diameter, it can be of the order of tens or hundreds of uh, microns. We just cannot simulate by MD such long tubes. But what we do find is that the entry length is very large. So if you were to have a membrane using nanotubes, these uh, tens of microns is the comparable to the membrane thickness. So you are going to find that the, uh, that the interfacial resistance is going to dominate in the tube not the internal diffusion, uh, the, not the internal diffusion that you find in the infinitely long tube. Here I'm plotting the excess relative inter, uh, interfacial resistance versus length and for different kinds of tubes. Uh, and this is time with exactly 1.4 angstrom spacing, 6, 6 nanotube, 8, 8, 10, 10, and 12, 12. So for the 6, 6 nanotube, where the alpha is the smallest, it's uh, the, uh, which I showed earlier, you find it is all interfacial resistance. The interfacial resistance is almost 100%, 90 to 100%, even at one micron lengths. Even at 12, 12 nanotube, for 400 nanometer tube, it's maybe 40, and this is for hydrogen, 40%. Uh, uh, so on the other hand, for methane, also, uh, you find here for a 400 nanometer tube, it's almost complete interfacial resistance, while for hydrogen, the interfacial resistance is very small. Uh, it may be at very small lengths, it's controlled by interfacial resistance. So carbon nanotubes, because they are very fast uh, and uh, they are thought not to be selective. This uh, here, uh, what I showed in this inset is a 12-12 CNT. Now, they are thought not to be very selective uh, because of the large diameter. You cannot do molecular sieving. But what we now find is that when you have very short nanotubes of micron thickness or 100 nanometer thickness, you may actually see good selectivity, possibly potentially see good selectivity. We are not yet at the stage where we can make them cleanly of a given size, and a given diameter, and given length. But when we achieve that, they are potentially uh, they put, have potential applications or they may have potential applications in separation. This here psi is one minus D naught internal or D naught infinity is the interfacial resistance, which is the excess resistance due to the entry length. We also found the same in zeolites. Zeolites are a lot rougher. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bhatti, if I may just interrupt, we might have to get a little bit uh, faster. Yeah, I'm finishing now. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, for zeolites, we found uh, the interfacial resistance to be significant below about 100 nanometer length. Uh, this is SAS zeolite, that's MFI, and that's PON. Uh, three different zeolites. Um, the relative interfacial resistance is quite high. Uh, uh, only is high only in very small systems. So if, again, if we come to ultra thin membranes of the nanometer dimensions, uh, tens of nanometer dimensions, the interfacial resistance is going to be important. What we also found is that there's a diffusivity profile within zeolite. These are three different zeolites, PON, MFI, and SAS. That's, and this is methane. For SAS, which is a three-dimensional zeolite uh, right here, or rather, which, is, uh, <clears throat> which has uh, 
pores of this uh, cage window type structure, uh, you find the entry length is quite small. It reaches 100% of its diffusivity within five nanometers. But for uh, pond zeolite, which is about one dimensional channels like this, or silicolite, which has MFI, which is these three dimensional channels, you have uh, pretty close, but uh, the 30 nanometer, which means at the middle, you have pretty close to 100%. So 15 nanometers uh, appears to be the entry length. Hydrogen, which has the highest alpha, has even has the smallest uh, entry length. This is for pond zeolite. And for uh, other gases, uh, which is methane and uh, ethane, you have larger entry lengths we see here. Okay, I'm just about to finish with uh, the last slide, hopefully. Uh, and we found experimentally uh, that there is an interfacial resistance in hierarchical materials. One of my students, Mauricio uh, Bonilla, had done experiments with a SAPO-34 produced by burning nanotubes, which were placed inside the zeolite while it was being synthesized. So you make the zeolite with the nanotubes, you burn them out, calcine them, and you get a network of mesophores. These are 10 nanometer tubes. We, uh, this was provided by Caskill, and the experiments are done by us together with Jo Keger in his laboratory in Leipzig. So the bottom curve here is the curve for um, the pure zeolite with no nanotubes. The top curve is the one with the nanotubes uh, burnt out. So you have a hierarchical material with a mesopore micropore structure. That's faster as you would expect. Now, when we fitted them to diffusion models, we found the standard internal diffusion model fitted only the pure zeolite, but the, uh, but the hierarchical material was fitted by a surface barrier model. Here, DC mu by DT is SVKM. That's the uh, equilibrium concentration in the micropores at bulk pressure P, and that's the concentration of the micropores of the zeolite. We, this is easily integrated to this exponential result. And we found so the hierarchical material is fitted by a, a surface barrier model. What that means is in the original material, you had a governing uh, diffusion, a go a diffusion inside the material as governing. Here, what is governing is this interfacial resistance as you're entering the material. So that's the nanotube pore and around it, you have a certain distance which will be uh, the entry length into the zeolite. So you have replaced one resistance by different resistance, internal diffusion by surface resistance. Depending on how much nanotubes you put, what was the fraction of your uh, mesopores that you introduce, this entry length can be significant compared to the size of the micropores domain that between them. So hierarchical materials can actually be controlled by this entry length that I talked about in the last few slides. I think I will end here. And uh, this is a summary. Uh, the Knudsen model significantly over predicts diffusion coefficients. The oscillator model provides an accurate option for estimating transport coefficients. Uh, multi-component, I discussed a multi-component approach to predict on Sagar coefficients uh, based on PO component diffusivities and bulk uh, based mutual diffusivities. I talked about effective medium theory, which is a good alternative for predicting poor and pure and multi-component transport coefficients in disordered systems. And then finite size nanomaterials can have large entry lengths with non-uniform transport coefficients leading to an effective interfacial resistance. And the entry length for CNTs is of the order of tens of microns and leads to a very large interfacial resistance for CNT lengths comparable to typical membrane thicknesses. And internal interfacial resistance may control uptake in hierarchical materials. Well, I will stop here. I think I have uh, spent more time than I uh, than I was expected to. But thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you for Professor Batia. Um, so we have some uh, questions here. Sure. Uh, the first one is that in the multi-component maxwell stefan diffusion model. Right. Uh, which diffusivity is measured experimentally 
or can be measured experimentally? All three, uh, but you would normally get the DIJ from, <clears throat> uh, from separate experiments, from binary experiment, diffusion experiments, even in the bulk. Okay. Let's get back to that. The very first of the second part. Yes, here, right? So for example, the, uh, the model at the bottom, hmm. right? Yeah, you can measure all of these diffusivities by fitting experimental data. Uh, okay. But usually DIJ, you can uh, measure separately by having binary diffusion of the two components. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's another one. Okay, yes. so uh, the, what, what are the effects of pressure in the, on the uh, diffusivity? Like a pressure increase will decrease the diffusivity or increase the diffusivity? It can be both. In very um, in pores that are small, in uh, smaller than a nanometer, typically it will decrease the diffusivity. That because uh, when you pack more molecules, they, uh, it doesn't leave uh, much space for them to move. It becomes too tight in the pore, right? Uh, physically, I mean, uh, physically, you can imagine the situation where you're packed as you increase the density, they start colliding with each other and they transfer momentum uh, and the molecules close to the wall, uh, they stick close to the wall uh, they are, and they are pushed closer to the wall, you get more friction and uh, you decrease. But when in a large pore due to viscous effects, uh, you can actually increase the diffusion, the diffusion coefficient increases with increase in uh, density. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bhatti, I have um, two questions. Uh, sure. One, um, the the pore mouth or the pore entrance effect that you discussed, how will that be conceptually different from the pore mouth resistances that we see in uh, carbon molecular sieves, which, which essentially allow us to do the nitrogen oxygen separations? Yes, uh, in carbon molecular sieves, it's due to the narrowness of the pore mouth and the pore body is different, of yep. a different size. Uh, on the other hand, here I'm talking of even an ideal pore, which is of uniform size, right? You have an entrance effect. Because uh, the, the, the other one essentially gets modeled as a first order. Um, uh, Correct. Process essentially. So yes. uh, effectively, uh, yes, you will get, it's an interfacial resistance. Yes. So yes. even this, when you have a very large pore is an interfacial resistance, but that, uh, but the effect you're talking of is due to narrowing of the pore mouth. Okay. So the pore mouth is narrower than the rest of the body. So here I'm talking of even ideal systems like a zeolite or a carbon nanotube, you have this effect. But will we be able to differentiate whether from, from an experimental perspective? You uh, need to be able to do transmission electron microscopy, examine the structure and get an understanding of what your structure is like, right? So macroscopic experiments are unlikely to provide a clear uh, distinction, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, however, you can look at things like activation energy and infer from there okay. whether it's poor mouth diffusion or not, uh, or poor internal diffusion. Okay. It's some, yeah, the, the, that, but we can discuss about it in greater detail. Uh, I have one question for, for the graduate students that are likely to review this talk. So, um, for example, you have discussed about these first principle models uh, and also the, um, the MD simulations. Right. What, what would your recommendation be for, let's say, for a student who is trying to describe either their experiments or to get started? When should they be picking one of these models over the other? Uh, yes, whether to do, go into molecular dynamics based models or to go into these, uh, uh, the, uh, these first principle models. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. If you know the structure well, and it's uh, close to ideal, then you can use these first principle models. Um, on the other hand, uh, if, it is, uh, if you know the structure, uh, like I did with the activated carbon, there is no way you can do it with the first principle models. You've got to go to the molecular dynamics based models approach. Okay. So it all depends on the structure. If it can be idealized uh, without losing too much of the physics, then I would recommend the first principle models. And I gave some of the uh, applications here. 
uh, a very large number of papers, which actually shows how we have applied these first principle models to uh, understand uh, diffusion in membranes. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Konkri. Thank you, Professor. Thank I you. think that, that uh, concludes our Q&A session. So now I am handing over to Guo Ping. Okay, can I stop sharing now? Yes, okay, good. Please. Thank you, Professor Suresh Bhatia for your presentation. We also thank all the attendees for joining this webinar and hope it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted on IS YouTube channel with an announcement on IS Twitter feed. The hope is that the work discussed today will be a useful resource for the adoption community in the future and announcements regarding the next seminar and other IAS online events will be posted on our Twitter feed and through the IAS mailing list. With that, we thank you for joining us and we hope you will join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.